So let's see. I am regrazing this. This isn't my stockpile. I ran out of stockpile on January 1st. Uh, just like everyone else, I'm a student too, so I'm trying to figure it out. I don't know how many of y'all were here last class, but last class I had them in a paddock, maybe from my back to the fence, like that. And I moved them every 24 hours. And I was still kind of on the mindset to get them to graze the top third and trample the two thirds, but we're definitely switching it up now with higher density. This morning, you see this post, and you see the post down there? That's what I gave them. And now we'll move them into here. And it may even still be a little bit too, too big. I'm seeing a lot of green This left. is the, the, the third move or the fourth move? Today is a little tricky because uh, I ran into some trouble this morning and they were out kind of munching out there because I was working them and I had some other issues arise. So today, and I apologize for that because y'all are here, but today isn't the best kind of example. Um, but, you know, yesterday, for example, you know, they were here. I've been moving them twice a day and I give them two fish posts down. So I'll give them two and then I'll give them two and then I'll give them two. So for example, on the first day, they would have taken up one, two, three, the, the first four posts down there. So that's the concentration of the density. And like when I move this fence, I mean, they'll all go right, right here. So that in that moment is my, is my animal density. There are a few things just to kind of piggyback with Jimmy that he said that I immediately noticed. One is with this denser grazing, they're definitely like the chart that, that Jimmy had of time and quality. They get more of a consistent meal every, every day. Now this is January and what they're eating in June may be yeah. different then. There we go. But I leave them in here for five days. And then I put them in here for five days. So they're getting more of a consistent meal. And they're also, they're eating more because they have less time to do it and they're a little more excited to do it is another thing. The other is um, I am really personally convinced that the animals really like it. I really think they like to move. I really believe that. Like, hey, do you like this? Yes, I do, you know? It's much more steady for them and me and they have responded to that. I mean, it was steady when I was moving them once a day, but still now it's, it's even more so like, all right, time to eat, all right, time to eat. Um, another thing is, um, is uh, manure and urea concentration. It's not, you know, perfect or anything, but it's, it's a lot higher and greater per area now than it used to be. It used to be very sporadic, and now I feel like it's more concentrated. Yeah. And it's just kind of that ability of, you know, utilizing them and, and, and utilizing is getting all that forage and then having them convert it. We spoke a little yesterday and the more and more I hear Jimmy talk, the more I just hear him saying density. I feel like the majority of what you say can be taken back to, to density, either and, by theory or by practice. And, and non-selective grazing. And non -selective. Because you can have high density to try to trample 90%. And you have the density, but not the consumption. So that's the big difference. Yeah. Can you talk about your thought process as far as the back fencing and not back fencing? On day four, I'll keep this fence, which is actually tomorrow. So but tomorrow's a little days. different because it's going to be so cold. I'm I'm probably going to stick them in the woods and feed them some hay. So every three or four days you back. Fence. I do it every four. Yes. It's winter, so it doesn't grow as I fast as in spring. When we were doing it on vegetable land, I would keep the back fence every time just to make absolutely sure that they trampled. And that was more of an annual cover crop situation, uh, which is something that we're excited about too and, and have a lot to learn, but is incorporating animals into a vegetable program as well. We've got some vegetables. So, you, so you please uh, observe down and see how all the exposed growing points, all the growing points will be exposed to sunlight. Come spring, it will create a much leafier sword than if you leave it like back there where it wasn't grazed non-selectively. We'll see it later. 
but uh, this is what we want to achieve, more or less this. Did yeah, this it? is pretty good. <laughs> Over there at the top, we can look at it when we go out. Yeah. Right up there at that little hill is really, really good. Can you give some good light? Sure. I want to say one quick thing. The principles are all the same. It's the practices and implementation of those principles that are going to be different on all our farms. As far as just logistically this netting, it's something we're still learning with. We've done strands, the sheep, not complaining, the sheep are tough. You got to have a hot fence and they got a big thick coat. Yeah. Um, one strand for cattle is a dream. Like, <coughs> man, I'd love to do that. And I hope to get there one day with the sheep. And if you time it good enough, you can achieve it. But what I really want to say is don't let all this netting intimidate you if you do or don't want to use it. It's really, you set up your brakes and you set this up and you'll see it's really, it's really quick to move them. A lot of people come out and they're like, oh my God, you're netting. Come on, everybody. I use netting. Do you think these yeah. girls are staying back because we're here? Yeah. 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 They're just worried about us. Yeah, sheep are. I know. So scared. Got a little slack. Yeah. Worry about that steer jumping I'm, out. I can't believe he stays in there with them. Well, I mean, it's it's a I'm testimony to if you do it. That's uh, if you do it enough with consistency, they um. They mind, they behave. And he's a Charlotte? Yeah. He's pretty. Yeah, he's a real jerk. Let me hop in here, man. Jimmy, you want to talk about genetics for a hot second? Yeah. Okay. We're okay. going to talk about genetics. Even in sheep or in cattle, adaptive genetics are so important. Because we need an animal that can eat more relative to its weight or to its size than an animal that eats less. How will an animal that eat less look like? Skinny. Tall and lanky. We want an animal that looks short and wide. And it's bulging at the seams. An eight in five package. Like if you put eight pounds of sugar on a package made for five pounds of sugar. So if we look at these animals and look for that type of package, we see many that, that have it. So we want to select rams from them, and the rams have also to look like that, besides being very masculine. What is a masculine trait? Wide hips or wide shoulders? Wide shoulders. So we want the rams to be wide shoulders. Okay, we want them to look masculine. That means their hormone balance is correct. Looking at the mother, then what? Then you're looking for feminine. 
Craig. I'm looking for white hips. The most white feminine hips female. And narrow shoulders. Narrow she shoulders, has to wide hips. Triangular, hip. like a dairy jersey cow. Okay. Even in sheep. Okay. okay? So when uh, a masculine ram will give you feminine daughters and masculine sons, and the same with the bulls. Okay. So that that's very important, and it has been ignored for a long time. Once we do that, we have animals that can do it under this type of management and low input, and then we can improve the soil the fastest and make more money. She's pretty good. Her yeah. right here? Yeah, yeah. She's short. She's got a big gut. Very She's nice. She's got a big capacity. Um, There's a lot of fluctuation in this nice. flock, but I'd say a couple of things. One is, the whole parasite thing, we, we don't worm. Yeah. We um, never worm. That's important. I've seen some that are wormy and, you know, freaked out and, oh my gosh. And, and I've given them um, garlic barrier, which... Uh, no, but chemicals are me. We haven't put chemical wormers in these guys in quite a while. If I see one that's really ratty and wormy, if I see one that's ratty and not thrifty, I'll take him or her out. It's usually, it's a lamb. It's always been a lamb born that season. It's not like an older ewe. And I'll, if they have worms bad, we'll give them worms, chemical worms. Most but. recent animals that we pulled, we gave them a garlic natural wormer and we pulled them away from the breeding flock when we introduced the rams. And we're just trying to keep them alive until the spring and see if they'll be able to feed enough to, for us to harvest them. We don't necessarily want to sell them if they're not thrifty, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. we just want to try to keep them on until they're not just wasted, just, I guess. That's the goal. Just don't reproduce from them. Yeah, the yeah, biggest not reading them. The biggest piece is to understand, like, all right, this is my system. This is what you guys are going to have to deal with. This is what we're doing it. If you can't make it, I'm sorry, but most everyone else can, to not reproduce that and not keep that in your flock or herd mm -hmm. and not keep those genetics. And try not to let them die, you know, like spot mm -hmm. it and be compassionate enough to... Mm -hmm. And I say try, like, you know, I've... I've lost some. Um, anyway, so there's a fair amount of fluctuation in this, but not too bad. And every year it gets better, and every year as your animals, you know, as your, as your gene pool and stock to choose from increases, you can pick and choose the traits that you want that fit your system and your, uh, on your uh, farm. As long as 80% or more of, of your flock does well, you're on the right track. So just get rid of the, the ones that don't make it. In nature, that is done by predators. Here we do it more from humanity. It's, we it, do it. it's interesting to hear you say that because we culled out 20% of 2015 lambs. 20% of them weren't going to do it. Which I kind of, how do I say it? It's not that I don't care about that number, about those animals. I just mean next year I'd really like to see that go to 18 or 15%. And then I'd really like to see it go to... Well, you know, I want that to decrease. I mean, I'm seeing some that are really looking good. They're big, they're <coughs> bad, they're performing. They don't get too hot in the summer. They perform well. They don't get too cold in the winter. They can be really thrifty and really advantageous to your farm. You can pretty much guarantee a, a lamb uh, their first breeding, and after that, you're pretty much guaranteed two or three. Um, and last year was the, because you start thinking about that and it's like, all right, well, she'll have one and maybe it's a daughter and then she'll have two next year, but then her daughter will have one, blah, blah, blah. You start thinking about that. And last year was the year it really kind of compiled for us. Um, we had more or less, uh, we had, I think, 45. I don't have my numbers in front of me. But what I'm saying is this past lambing season, we more or less doubled the flock. And that will only continue to... Tell to, them that you're feeding some hay first thing I'm, in the morning. I'm feeding hay first thing in the morning to help balance their rumen on this on this grass um, to prevent scourers. Uh, I've gotten it locally. I haven't... I need to do a big shopping for hay and get it, all, everything but, I but need. But how much do you feed? I feed one bill. One so square 50, bed, like 50 pounds 40, 50 a day. Pounds. Yes. That big guy is one fourth of that. Yeah. Oh, he's eating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's not much, but it's no. very important so they don't get nitrate poisoning on a cloudy day like today. Nitrates in the winter are a um, 
uh, are an issue as well. I only thought, I I shouldn't say that, but it it exists in vegetables and that's when I first heard of it. But if you have a lot of cloudy days in winter, nitrates can build up in your vegetables or grass. Um, And in extreme cases, it can be lethal to to Yes, yes, yes. And hay is a good balance as well? Yes, a little low quality hay, not high in protein. That doesn't smell bad, just too. So the rumen has something. When that high nitrate stuff can go in, then it won't be damaging. I, I would like to go now, Rocco, to see that pasture. Sure, let's go. possible. We we'll go wherever you want. This part was grazed selectively, trying to graze the top third of stockpile pasture, and this is the result. This means that they ran out of stockpile before time. If it hadn't been a warm winter with rain, we wouldn't have that regrowth to put the chip on. So that's why we need to keep to the program of grazing non-selectively. Then we have enough cow days taken off each acre, and we don't need to feed hay. I mean, feeding hay as the only source. And if we look down on this grass, you look below and try to find the growing point. And they, they die yeah. because of the excess shape. Now, if you keep doing this year after year, you start getting wider plant spaces. Clumps. Yes. You just wire a big clump. And if you smell it, as I told you over there, root, rot and decay. Yeah. If, if that's not contributing to improving yeah. the soil through photosynthesis, right. remember our main focus of energy is the, the sun. So Jimmy, yeah. what about all this? Like there's gonna be some portion of this left over. And if we walk right over there, I'm sure that we can see it. Yeah. Is this, this isn't something to worry about. No. Just grace non-selectively, try to take all down. Like, let, let's go over there and see it. This is very important. It's good that you mention it, Rocco. You know, the microorganisms in the soil don't have wings to fly and get the stuff that is not touching the soil. You brought me over here to tell me that? Yes. <laughs> because this has been trampled down by the hoof action because you had much higher densities. Mm-hmm. Now they can degrade this and convert it into humus. Right. Most of it, not all. As I told you, this was not perfect. I prefer <coughs> four months per day. The, the chip will do better and this will be more evenly trained. Four months four a day. Four months a day in the winter. In the winter. And two in the growing season. So yeah, even here. Yeah, I bought you here because now you can see that this is going to be very nice in spring, unlike that. Mm-hmm. So even here you would do four moves? Yes, because ruminants eat for an hour and a half and lay down. More or less. So you're stimulating them to eat more? Huh? You're stimulating them to eat more? Yes. I mean. So how much, because I have a lot more grass than them. So I should be grazing, because I took mine off the grass. I thought I, I was like you, you know, I ran out of, I thought I ran out of grass, but I've, I've got grass that's six or eight inches now. Right, like that one then? At least that, yeah. Okay, then so you, should, I, you should graze it. I because should. it was a warm, late fall and winter. Yeah. So you got more growth than normal. Right, yeah. so I should go ahead and graze it and get yeah. them off. I'd love to get them off of the the hay. Just give them some low quality hay before putting them out and in very small breaks. How many cows? Okay, that equals 15 of those. Mm-hmm. Right, so right. You, so, so imagine that 72 animals, that strip divided and you know how big, a very small strip. I'm good with okay, that. I like small strips, yeah. But if I had two, I would put a, a rope and stake them. Oh, That's really? much easier than you just move them. That's what they do in Europe. Oh, they don't use electric like fence for five or six cows. They just stake them and move them. Oh. Get a flavor. Okay. And then you take the water to get them. And you need them. <laughs> yeah, it's, it can be done. It's easy. Well, they're dairy cows. They should, right? Yeah, they will. Just train them. Okay. That was good. Yes, yes. Any other thing? I don't think so. Okay. Any questions?
Any questions or observations? Jim, one other quick question. Yes. If you were to come in and graze this, you wouldn't feed any hay because you've got plenty of dead stuff in it? Oh, uh, yeah. That's Would correct. That's correct. Oh. Uh, over there is green. Yeah. This is not green. This is the leftover of a selective grazing. Mm -hmm. So the quality is just not there. So you're saying selective because the density wasn't high enough. And the uh, goal was to graze the top third. And this is the result. Is the corner post free, free choice? No. No, it has to be hand fed like in the plastic drums. That's how we do it. We only feed half a pound per cow per day. But you can feed other stuff like I was saying a uh, wheat brand, like a uh, beet pulp. Yeah, beef, yeah. soy meal, any of those things. Uh, not soy meal. Sure. Not yeah. soy meal. When you have too much protein, no. Yeah. You, have, you, know, you need a digestible fiber, not starches. Starches go against fiber digestion. Beef pulp has a lot of sh sugar in it, right? Yeah, you cannot feed much. But the sugar, most of the sugar was taken out. So your point is this was not grazed enough. Yes, it's, it's plain to see. The problem here is that instead of moving them uh, tw four times a day, mm -hmm. th these were being moved twice a day. Yeah. So that's why they are living a little more than you would like. Than you than I would like at this time of the year on this stock yeah. panel. Okay. All right. And this is almost and, all and, pesky, and, and there's almost no diversity. Here. Of course, and that's not good for the soil or for the <laughs> next grazing. Will this produce less or more leaves than over there? <laughs> less. Much less. Because and we, we need a larger solar panel, not a smaller one. Yeah. Yeah. So don't be afraid. Huh? So be bold. Yeah, great severely, not, yeah. not just top grace. But then the, the enough uh, rest period. Recovery time. Right. What do you think is what? 30 to 45 days, depending on the season. For the for stockpile is the fall season, mm -hmm. and for grazing the growing season, <coughs> maybe 30, uh, 40 to 60. 40 to 60. Yeah. You said uh, or 30 warms? depends. I don't know. Warm okay. annuals are the best thing to stockpile. No, not better than Perennials. 50. Mm -hmm. Not better than 50, but better than clover. Mm -hmm. Yes. Clover. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you get a hard freeze. They, yeah, turn to powder. So best is the best for winter for the pork? Yes, it is. Stockpile best. Mm -hmm. So uh, when would be the last time you would graze um, during the summertime with your best? It's a stockpile. Did it really? Uh, yeah, this reason. Early spring? Yeah. yeah. Early spring? Early spring. Early spring. late spring. So you're going to let all summer be that yeah. yeah. It'll be like this. Yeah. Oh, yeah, easy. How long did this grow before grazing? Yeah. How long of stockpile? Early spring, late spring, or when do you stop grazing it to allow it to stockpile? June? June? Yeah, about okay. June. Uh, this it, area? We need a uh, stockpile to stop grazing it like in uh, uh, March, April. Mm -hmm. Then instead of this, it will be this big. And then you have a lot of forage. So you equip March April? Yes. How do you determine how much? It depends on your needs. It's a, it's an art. It's not only a technical. Just try, try it and see. Trying to figure out how many acres you'd have to do. Oh, one third of your farm. One third. Uh, like in the drawing back there. Shouldn't that be determined by how many cows you have? No. It will be okay. determined more by how the year was. Did it rain enough? Was it warm enough? Or, or the cold stay too long? They will be determined by that. Some years it will be one third, some years it will be more, some years less. Yeah. That's just a... So we'll never be the same. No, yeah. never yeah. ever. Yeah. Okay. Because, because you come back to the first great paddock when it starts to send up the flag leaf. The flag leaf. Yes. Okay. When would that happen each year? I don't know. <laughs> so here's the other question that you, you look at all these guys and they're all saying ultra high, ultra high, get up your stock density. And what happens when you have a drought? Then you go to your 
stockpile. That's why you have the other two thirds of the farm or you stockpile. Eat big stock. If you do what I show there in the in the drawing, mm -hmm. you have at least six months to this stock to plan to do something, because you know that it stopped growing and you still have two thirds of the farm. So on one third, you are growing as many cows as you can, and because you on set average. aside two thirds, you have a big That's enough buffer research. to be able to. There you go. And this year you will be able to carry more doing it this way mm -hmm. because you create a better soil life to do photosynthesis root exudate. That's my experience. Okay. So if you had good plant diversity here and you had your average rainfall, can you estimate what would be uh, the maximum you could stock? In no, like this? no, because it will improve every year. Mm. It never reaches a... And not in my experience. I've never seen it reach, no. In my ranch in Mexico on, a, on a 200 acres, I started with 200 cows. Right now I'm in 420 cows. Can I go to 500? I expect to, and yes. How many years did that take? 15. 15? Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. But that's a lot, because uh, it was already much higher than the neighbors, and now it's way up. Now it's like uh, seven times higher. How many inches in rain here? Uh, there we get a 40. 40? Yeah. <clears throat> so it depends. So I stockpiled this. Mm -hmm. And like, if you look now, I mean, there isn't a lot of green, right? I mean, there's not a lot growing, but I had this down to where there was no green. So this, the, this, the carbon the oxidized material is what was left previous. So I need to just grow more. And I feel like it worked though. I mean, I feel like I'm seeing- Oh yeah, you did much better than grass before. Grass is growing where there weren't before. Yes, yes it will improve, but, uh, it's just a 10% difference that I'm talking about. What you did was 80% of perfection. One very important thing that I didn't say over there is that the saliva of the ruminant promotes growth up to 80% faster than cutting. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that saliva, the closer to the ground, to the crown, the, oh. the, the more it expresses itself. What's it called on the cattle's nose, smooth? That's another bacteria. But in the saliva, and in the, both combined, mm -hmm. produce up to 80% more grass. Wow. wow. So it, the closer to the ground we can graze and then leave enough time to recover, the higher the production will be. We're enhancing photosynthesis. Okay, so if you have no other questions, let's get out of the rain. Okay.